hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Kyle the Pug Sports Review Show, episode number nine. We got a number of topics to talk about today, including a breaking news story. So uh, let's get right down to the nitty gritty. I am Kyle the Pug, aka Kyle Lodi, and you can call me whatever. It doesn't matter, Kyle or Pug. I can definitely do both, but. Anyways, welcome to the show, episode number nine. Like I said before, we got some topics today, and of course, we're going to talk to somebody who's got some explaining to do here in a bit, but we will make him explain his, uh, or not explain him explain, but make him eat his own words, it's Cowboy Nick. Actually, yes, you are. No, no, no. Okay, the reason why I say this reason why I say this is because we are going to talk about gave the Game 7 recap of the Warriors and the Thunder, and let's just say somebody on our show, <coughs> Cowboy Nick, <coughs> said that the Warriors had no chance of coming back being down 3-1 to one against the Thunder, and then look what happened all of a sudden. The Warriors did not give up. They won three straight games, and now they're going to be heading to the finals for the second year in a row against the Cleveland Cavaliers, which we will explain in a bit, but Cowboy, you have some explaining to do, buddy. You thought that the Thunder were going to close it out in six. Not just him, but they had no answer for Clay Thompson also. Yeah. Clay Thompson was the actual true well not well not the you know the true MVP, the MVP obviously Curry was, but the MVP of that whole series I think was Clay Thompson. This this is the rematch from last year's. Well, we'll get to we'll get to that shortly. But like I said, I mean the thought my thoughts on that game. I mean you knew Golden State was going to come out swinging on Game Seven, and I mean they took a bit of time to do so. But thanks to of course Curry and Thompson and Draymond Green, obviously they got the job done. But in your mind, let me let me let me interrupt you for a second. But in your mind, you literally weren't happy because I mean I know you were in your heart, but in your mind, I'm saying you were because the fact that Oklahoma City, like you said, got a little bit overconfident, and you just gotta feel bad for the players on the team like Durant and Westbrook. Who I got, they have so much talent on that team. It's just. It's the, I mean, how would you feel if you had a 3-1 to one series lead and it all just went away in the next three games afterwards? You couldn't even finish another game. Yeah, that's not fun. That's not fun at all. The last time that's happened was, I believe, in the 2007 first round. It was the uh, Lakers and the Suns, I think, yeah. the first round. I believe that's – I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but – I remember correctly when after Kobe hit that game-winning shot. That, that was like a long, long time ago. It was like nine years ago, I think. But anyway, so uh, was it 2000? I think it might have been 05, 06. I'm not sure. i got to go back and look. But anyways, Cowboy, like I said, you're eating your own words, and you just got to feel bad about yourself right now in the past couple of episodes. A 
again. All right, so let me let me let me uh, ask you this question before we move on. Do you, do you think the Warriors won the series, or did Oklahoma City blow it? Real quick. Okay. Yes, and then the Warriors show that they're you know the heart of the champion mentality. They show why they're going to go back to the and all that stuff. But. Anyways, we're going to be moving on here. Well, not moving on, but we're going to stay in the NBA topic here. We're going to talk about the uh, Cavaliers and the Golden State Warriors and how that final is going to be turning out, of course, as part two of the uh, seven-game set NBA Finals. So uh, according to uh, ESPN's Basketball Power Index, they're giving the Cleveland Cavaliers only a 25% chance of being the Golden State Warriors in the NBA Finals. And this is with a healthy squad, too. Given the steep hill to climb, the Cavaliers have to craft a game plan that takes advantage of their strengths and weaknesses to, uh, and the matchups that favor for them also, while minimizing the weaknesses and avoiding unfair rule matchups. And since the 73 win Warriors do not have many weaknesses and a few matchups that don't favor them, the Cavaliers need to think a little differently. Focus on the three points of the emphasis below will help the Cavaliers just do that. So... Cowboy Nick, uh, what do you think of this 25% chance according to uh, the Power Index by ESPN's Basketball Association? Well, I, 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 I look at this one, I would say that the Cavaliers are going to be perfect. And remember, they do have a fully healthy lineup. Oh, yeah. Well, Unlike last year. The Warriors, yeah, the Warriors are definitely disciplined by far. Especially the past three games when they were facing elimination. So here's I'm gonna real quick I'm gonna bring out a little stat for you just really really quick when uh, Iman Shumpert, Matthew Delladova or Delavadova excuse me and uh, LeBron James are on the court together they generate turnovers on 16.3 percent of possessions which that would be you know third in the league so when Kyrie Irving and J.R. Smith are on the uh, court with LeBron. They create turnovers on a 13.9 and basically a 14% of possessions, good for 20th in the league. So focusing on the turnovers may mean finding more time for Delhi and Shump and a little less for uh, Kyrie and J.R. Smith. Wouldn't you think so? All right, so the obvious ob objection to the second point of focus is that less Kyrie and JR means less offense, which brings us to the third point of focus for the Cavaliers, and that's basically that capital T word, transition. Transition is huge for the Cavaliers at this point of the uh, NBA Finals. Because if you don't have a transition, then uh, what's your game plan? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, the Raptors did too, but they didn't have enough uh, firepower to contend with the, uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers at that point. Yeah. 
very, very true. So, moving on here. So, we're going to probably get to some breaking news that happened, like, a bit, like, over an hour ago. But we're going to talk about it here anyway. So, Kenneth Starr will be stepping down as Baylor Chancellor. So, he is resigning as Chancellor in the wake of a huge shakeup at the university. But he will continue to teach in the law school, pretty much, Joe Shad told the school's president at ESPN on Wednesday. So... Starr said in an interview with Outside the Lines that he was resigning effective immediately as a matter of coincidence. After an independent review of Baylor's response to sexual assault allegations, many of them against athletes, Starr had been removed as school president last week, but he was being transitioned into a full-time chancellor role and was allowed to continue to teach at the law school. His uh, duties as chancellor were to include external fundraising and religious liberty. He had... He was to have no operational duties at the university at that time. So, on Wednesday, he Star was called for transparency at Baylor, and he said, and I quote, "As each day goes by, that that needs to become more and more pressing. We need to put this horrible experience behind us, and we need to be honest." So, this ha this basically just happened, you know, like I said, over an hour ago. What do you think about all this, cowboy? All right, so Starr also added that he, quote-unquote, <clears throat> didn't know what was happening regarding the allegation of Baylor's mishandling of sexual assault allegations, but he, quote-unquote, willingly accepted responsibility. And he also added, quote-unquote, the captain goes down with the ship, unquote. So what do you, what do you think? We may, we may, and this, <clears throat> excuse me, this might turn into another, uh, well, not another Jerry Sandusky situation, but I'm pretty sure it won't be that serious, but you never know. <coughs> excuse me, so, anyways, um, so the Baylor scandal didn't just cause star, football, co God, excuse me, coach, Art Bryles was suspended with intent to terminate, and athletic director Ian McCaw also resigned, you know, as well. So another of uh, other, a number of others at the university pretty much lost their jobs as well. So normally we would think that Baylor can be disciplined, you know, disciplined school, but you look at the uh, job history, you know, behind, you know, in the past when people losing their jobs, it's kind of a pretty big, you know pretty big little record behind uh, what's going on with the jobs at Baylor. So, well, here, well, here's something else I was gonna add here. So, basically, basically, Star was, you know, he was popular among the students for his participation in the quote-unquote Baylor line, which is a, um, if you don't know what that is, it's a school tradition in which freshman students wear yellow shirts and rush the field before home games. 
And he was often seen doing that at other sporting events as well. So what does that tell you? He was very involved and he was very motivated about doing it. Yeah, I don't think that there's a point of sexual at all. So, he, so he, excuse me, that he just wanted to um, show the fans on what it's like to actually have a good time, though, and just rush the field and, you know, just, like I said, have a good time. <clears throat> Well, that they you see you see that everywhere, and not just European football games, but they have it sometimes. You know, baseball games, football games, and people are just a bunch of drunk idiots too. <laughs> well, it, well, is Chancellor the Chancellor? You should say the President, Chancellor, whatever you want to call. Well, anyways, under Star's watch, Baylor enjoyed the uh, unprecedented athletic success. So the 2011-2012 academic year is often referred to as the year of the bear, but quote-unquote by Baylor alumni and fans. During the 2011 season, Bears quarterback at the time, Robert Griffin III, became the school's first Heisman Trophy winner. The women's basketball team finished became the first NCAA squad, men's or women's, to finish 40-0, and, and uh, star Brittany Grimer was named a National Player of the Year. Baylor's, Baylor's men's basketball team started 17-0 and, and reached the Elite Eight of the NCAA tournament, and the baseball team won 49 games. So. so, hashtag Year of the Bear. Yeah, that is right, though. I mean, it's. I mean, people will keep that tradition saying that you know the year will not be over yet for the year of the bear, but it's, it's just beginning for them as well. So, anyway, okay, before we move on here to the hockey top, we got a couple minutes here remaining. Uh, did I mention that the Dodgers gave Jake Arrieta his first loss since July 2015? No, they no, they actually did though. So. <laughs> Which is, well, well, real quick, I want to talk about it, which is funny because the Dodgers, last time they played against Jake Arrieta, they got no hit by him at Dodger Stadium, only to the fact that they came out, they actually had a pitching duel between Casimir and Arrieta, like, through the seventh and then the eighth inning to the ninth inning, they just kind of lit him, not lit him up, but the runs they scored kind of made the difference for the Dodgers in that win, so, real quick, I just want to get your thoughts on that. Oh, so when the Cubs lose, then now then then your uh, bias side starts to come out. Okay, I can I see how it is. Alright, you, you, know, you know what I would say about that, since you're starting to become biased? I'm going to be biased for just this, like, one second. Highly doubtful. But, <laughs> anyway, so, um, moving on here really quick, enough of, uh, Dodgers and Jake Arrieta on the, um, Kenneth Starr, Baylor Chancellor, or sexual assault allegations. Yeah, we're, we're done with all of that for, right, for the time being until Friday, so... Right now, we are going to get into the Stanley Cup Finals. Nick, you, you know what to do, man. It's all yours.
Three to two. Well, here, well, here's the uh, well, okay. Well, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I did a video review on the Stanley Cup <clears throat> game one preview. I'll probably put that link in the description below so you guys can go check it out. Um, so basically, what I did was I talked about you know the whole review of the game one, see what went right, what went wrong for each teams, and who did what in the between periods and all that. And basically, from what I saw in the Stanley Cup for game one, I'll repeat myself again is that it was all Penguins game one, or <clears throat> not game one, but the first period. Second period, it was all Sharks. And then game three was kind of bit, a bit even down to the point where it kind of hit the uh, 230 mark where there was one guy, I forgot who it was on the Sharks, he lost his stick, and he tried to get the puck out without his stick. And I was just thinking, what are you, what in God's name are you doing? And then, and then that opened up the door for Nick Benino and his little uh, little floater about right to uh, get by Martin Jones, the uh, Sharks goaltender. And that was the end of that. That was that was the key moment right there in the game where he made that idiotic move trying to uh, get the um, get the puck out of there without a stick. Because if you notice, the stick was right in front of Martin Jones. It wasn't it wasn't Martin Jones' stick, but it was. Uh, it was somebody else's stick. I forgot whose it was. No, it was like that for both sides. Okay, well, let me stop you right there for a second. So I just want to, real quick on what happened with the game one, I can tell you back a bit of insight of what happened. So I know I already, well, not, just not just being on with the players, but like I said, the Sharks, like in the first period of game one, they kind of had that bit of stage fright. Like they didn't know what to do, and they were kind of getting outshot and outmanned. I think the first, they were outshot like 14 or 4 or something like that in that first period. And then the Penguins, but the Penguins had the shot advantage because they were more physical, they were more aggressive, and it was just, uh, it was basically all Penguins on the offensive end. So if you had to give me an advantage on who did better on the offensive end, it was definitely Pittsburgh by far. I mean, I'm not trying to be, you know, trying to go against Sam. I mean, San Jose did well. I mean, Martin Jones, you know, for the, um, San Jose goalies is absolute. I mean, Matt Murray's also too. Yeah, they were there. They're both good though. I feel like I feel like Martin Jones wasn't getting any help defensively, and that's why he had all those thirty-eight saves. I mean, he was just he did all he could really. Thank you. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that was that was beautiful. That's why sort of what you're supposed to do. Boy, well, don't don't uh don't uh judge people on their heights. You gotta judge them on their uh, athletic ability. Well, he did get an assist, though. Actually, I saw that he got just one. It was it was just the kids that did the job for the Penguins. The two Penguins rookies, of course. And, of course, along with Nick Benito. He's, he was the unsung hero of this of game one. He was. And that's the thing. I, yeah, I talked about this in my uh, one of my uh, my videos on my main channel. I do love the Penguins, and I've respected them for a long time. I remember going back to um, Super Mario Lemieux, Yadimir Yager, and Ron Francis days. You just got to go back to them, especially, and not just them, but Colorado Avalanche's Patrick Watt is still being called one of the greatest goaltenders of all time in the NHL. And, of course, I've, of course, been a Sharks fan, Olin Nolan, and, of course, obviously Wayne Gretzky, considered one of the greatest hockey players, you know, of all time. Playing, of course, for, you know, the um, the Kings, the, um, I think the Blues, and then the Rangers. No, he played for the Canadians, too, first. I think. He played for the Rangers with uh, Anaheim, No, he didn't play for the Sharks. No, he. I'm looking. He never did. But I don't know what you're looking at. But anyway. Well, he hasn't been. Out there since you know 2005, six or something like that. I really don't remember exactly, but I think since uh, Martin Jones took over, he's been performing a lot better under pressure. Well, that's, you know, a record that nobody's really going to talk about for a long time. I mean, it'll, it's like kind of like an unsung hero kind of a story, like I said, you know, like a few minutes ago. But it's just, I, I mean, it's just one of those things where it's time for Martin Jones to take over. He's a bit younger, more athletic, more aggressive defensively, you know, stuff like that. You know what I mean? And basically what I going to expect out of game two, you know, coming, you know, later tonight. I don't expect it to be any different, but hopefully as a local fan, we're going to try to see a different result, but I expect to see, you know, fast-paced, aggressive, just flat-out good hardcore hockey. Oh, yeah. That's basically what I'm expecting to see. Well, it's not just that, but the San Jose Sharks line is also pretty aggressive, too. So it's like basically two walls trying to... It's like basically an unstoppable force versus a movable object who's going to collide into each other. So, <laughs> so, anyways, with that being said, thank you guys so much for enjoying the Sports Review Show episode number nine. And if you guys did enjoy the review show, please drop a like at the bottom of this video and a link to comment as well. So... With that being said, that's Cowboy Nick, and I'm Kyle the Pug, aka Kyle Lodi, Kyle or Pug, it doesn't matter what you call me, and we'll see you guys next time on Friday, same time, same place. Have a good day.
Spit it out. All right, well, I don't know if anybody's going to tune into that. But anyways, <clears throat> have a good day, and as always, stay safe.